The first writers and residents came to the James Merle House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merle's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited, staying in his home, a national historic landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you. Hi, um, I am Joanna Scott, a member of the James Merrill House Committee and former Merrill House Fellow. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our current Merrill House Fellow, Rob Schlegel, who comes to us from Walla Walla, Washington, where he teaches at Whitman College. Oh, I have a unique connection to Rob uh, since his first book, The Lesser Fields, was selected by my late husband, the poet James Longenbach, for the Colorado Prize for Poetry. I met Rob for the first time just this month, but I, Rob, I feel like I've known you for years. Uh, after Jim chose Rob's book for the Colorado Prize, they began an energizing correspondence and exchange drafts of poems. And I think uh, they met only once when they were both in New York and, and Jim came home from that meeting and reported that while he knew he would like you, Rob, he said it was even better than that. He said, <laughs> you were truly real deal nice, <laughs> along with being a really interesting young writer. Uh, I, I'm going to quote Jim here on um, just a little bit about your your work. He, he describes your style as characterized by a hard-won precision and luminosity of diction, an astonishing facility with strategically limited means. And about your subjects, he says, Rob probes liminal states of mind, the cusp between being and not being, uh, in, in describing the lesser fields, he wrote, Schlegel makes a world of absence and deprivation. Our world, the world of human mortality, feel like plenitude. It is a book that feels unshakably contemporary while resembling nothing else, a book that seems shockingly intimate while giving nothing away. I, I love that. And I'll add that uh, in, in reading your work, I'm so impressed with the way the, the pushing, the way the poems push deep into the, the most mysterious experiences and uh, partly with lines that visually and, and sonically keep moving and pressing, turning with sentences that keep moving down the page and deeper into meaning and, and partly with sets of astonishing questions that to me capture the feeling of bewilderment. Um, and, and just some of the, the questions I've picked out from, from your work uh, in a, a poem, uh, the lesser field, fr from the Lesser Fields titled Dusk by Flame. Isn't it all the before and after of every gesture remotely elegant? Or this from Secrets Object Share, the sea, is it copper or a month of tides and what they might conceal? Or this from the animal that therefore I am. What can I do with this material called real? You do amazing things with that material. The uh, Rob's second collection, January Machine, was selected by Stephanie Burt for the Grub Street National Book Prize. And the third collection in the tree where the double sex sleeps was selected by Brenda Shaughnessy for the Iowa Poetry Prize. And Rob's newest collection, Child Care, has recently been published by Four Way Books. And I'll just add that I've learned since Rob arrived in Stonington that before he became a poet, he was eyeing the prospect of a career in professional baseball. And I discovered that he'd been a pitcher. And I saw proof of this when we were out at walking along Napa tree and Rob picked up a stone and I tried to pick, I picked up a stone and I tried to skip my stone and it went nowhere. Rob skipped his stone and it disappeared across the bay. Hop, 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 hop. <laughs> so that's the picture in him, but also the poet. Like that skipping stone, really. The poems in the collection 
uh, childcare are, are have a precision. They're aimed with precision, and they manage to capture a, a world in motion, but also to to convey a sense of stillness. I I find them solemn, and yet irrepressibly playful. Uh, and in their fascination, in particular with the creativity of children, they are fascinating. Uh, Rob will be reading from Child Care, and uh, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about the poems. Uh, and we'll also, I should say, welcome comments from and questions from viewers. So I, I'll be keeping an eye on that if you want to send in some questions during our, our Q&A. So I'll turn it over to you, Rob. Thank you, Joanna. Um, and um, it, yeah, it's been such a uh, joy and exceedingly, um, I feel exceedingly grateful for, for being able to spend time with you, especially during these last few weeks in Stonington. Um, I also wanted to quickly thank um, Bergen and Penny and Catherine and, um, Sibby, Dave, and Jess, and the whole James Merrill board for creating such an amazing um, community for, for um, guest writers. It's kind of a phenomenal place. And um, uh, it feels transformative in a way that um, I'm just beginning to understand. And I'm sure it's going to be transformative as I um, leave and um, and, and remember what a great time I've had. Um, I think I'm going to try to sandwich my reading between two gyms. One is James Merrill, and then the other is um, James Longenbach, who um, Joanna had mentioned chose my first book and has um, been an incredibly important figure, not just in my um, poetry life, but in my life outside of poetry as well, um, just by correspondence. Um, so uh, I, I don't think I would be, um, I, I don't think I would be um, a Merrill Fellow probably if it weren't for so many of um, Jim's useful and um, deeply informed readings of my poems. So I'm going to start with um, a poem by, by James Merrill called After Greece. Light into the olive entered and was oil. Rain made the huge pale stones shine from within. The moon turned his hair white, who next stepped from between the columns, shielding his eyes. All through the countryside were old ideas found lying open to the elements. Of the gods' houses, only a minor presence here and there would be balancing the heaven of fixed stars upon a Doric capital. The rest lay spilled their fluted drums half sun in cyclamen or deep in water's biting clarity, which just barely upheld me the next week when I sailed for home. But where is home? These walls, these limbs, the very spaniel underfoot, races in sleep. Toward what? It is autumn. I did not invite those guests, windy and brittle, who drink my liquor. Returning from a walk, I find the bottles filled with spleen. My room itself smeared by reflection onto the far hemlocks. I some days flee and dream back to the exposed porch of the maidens, only to find my great-great-grandmothers erect there peering into a globe of red bohemian glass. As it swells and sinks, I call up graces, furies, fates, removed to my country's warm lit halls with rivets forced 
through drapery and nothing left to bear. They seem anxious to know what holds up heaven nowadays. I start explaining how in that vast fire were other irons. Well, art, public spirit, ignorance, economics, love of self, hatred of self, a hundred more, each burning to be felt, each dedicated to sparing us the worst. How I distrust them as I should have done those ladies. How I want essentials, salt, wine, olive, the light, the scream, no, I have scarcely named you and look, in a flash you stand full grown before me, row upon row, essentials dressed like your sister, caryatids or tombstone angels, jealous of their dead with undulant quaffers, lips weathered, cracked by grime, and faultless eyes gone blank beneath the immense zinc and gunmetal northern sky. Stay then. Perhaps the system calls for spirits. This first glass I down to the last time I ate and drank in that old world. May I also survive its meanings and my own. I'm glad that um, he wrote that poem because <laughs> it's my favorite. I think it's easily my favorite Merrill poem. I love it. Um, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are probably familiar with it too. Uh, it's been amazing to work um, in the David Jackson and the Merrill apartments. Um, I told some of the a board earlier um, that it's been tricky kind of for me to figure out how much technology to bring in to the Merrill side of the apartment. Um, partly because I feel like my electronics are gonna somehow manipulate the wavelengths of energy that I can feel over there in negative ways, um, which is kind of um, strange. But so I, I've been reading mostly in the Merrill side and then doing work um, on my own poems in the David Jackson side. Um, but also I've been browsing his library um, probably too much. I'm going to start with um, some poems from Child Care, um, which came out in March. And um, I should say that my father um, made this mono print, and we decided that this would be the cover about, well, a few months um, before he died unexpectedly. So um, I was extremely happy that he, he knew that um, this would be the cover. This is called The Sentence. In the gospel according to children, love is a sentence containing a logic no syntax can trace. Mom throwing parties just to ruin them, dad blaming everyone but himself. You remember it, don't you? Riding your bike past the city's edge into marshlands you thought were protected. Deep in the grass, a box labeled plot. From that point on, did you want them to acknowledge you? Or leave you alone with your paper boats inspired by birds so tired of performing? Wind buffets the mylar balloon trapped in the neighbor's red maple. Am I closer to the sentence than I am to Keisha? My daughter asks why elk pee on themselves. They found a logic, I say. Like Nero, my son says, to light his parties, he burned his own people as lanterns. 
My daughter dreamed I used the vacuum hose to suck the sentence from my eye. In my notebook, I write, the female figure my father sculpted props up a succulent too large for its pot. Daddy, my daughter says, when are you going to stop? She's building a spaceship large enough to carry her and her toy horse to a planet immune to the sentence. My son warns of nebula. What's that, she says. From Earth, it looks like a bright patch in the night sky. But what's it look like from space? My son turns away. My daughter closes the hatch over the horse's head. Stay safe, she says. Take a sentence of a dozen words. Take 12 men and tell to each one word. Stand the men in a row. Let each think of their word as intently as they will. Nowhere will there be a consciousness of the whole sentence. My daughter and I eat lunch at the kitchen table. My son reads in his room. Keisha is on campus. The semester has just ended. Not even the radio is playing. How do you hold mom's hand? My daughter says. Like this? Our fingers interlace. Or like this? I'll just add that um, the lines beginning, my daughter and I eat lunch at the kitchen table down four lines in that poem were actually just directly lifted from an email that I had sent to Jim Longenbach um, a couple weeks, probably before I, I finished that poem. This is called Poetry. Poetry is pointless, my son says. If you write that down, I'll kill you. I fear he fears the attention I give it. I used to drive till he fell asleep. Ten minutes, then silence the river knit with ice. In tonight's movie, a boat swerves against bullets. He sings the movie's theme. I kill you, you kill me. Plot against all that is good. Good for whom? I know every word that rhymes with my assailant's first name. It's difficult to achieve real world fear in a movie. My son crawls into bed. There's nothing I need more than you, I say. Not true, he says. The rudder turns in my throat. Every sleep, he needs me less. Subjective units of distress. One. My son loads a toothbrush with ozone. Tell me what you feel, I say. I feel like you're a jerk. No, I say, tell me what you feel. I feel like you're worthless and I hate you. Two, my father calls. His father is in the ICU. I don't know what to say. Well, my father says, I wrote a till the garden today. Three, between teaching and parenting, I somehow find time to notify my therapist of a change to my insurance. Four, what's your mom's mom's 
mom's mom's name. Five. A man at the ATM is trying to deposit his hand. Where he is, is earth. He's my father, my dad, the day before the day of my birth. Six. In the CVS, Neon touches my son and I, pretending to be strangers. Seven. My mother opens the oven with an oven mitt. Julie gave me this, she says. How is she, I say. Dead, she says. I told you that. Eight. Keisha is awake. She thought she heard me groaning in my sleep as if I suffered a violent blow to my face. Nine. My mother would turn on the faucet, wet a bar of soap. Her left hand held open my mouth. When will I reach the people I love? I sit where the shade would be if there were trees. Um, about 15 years ago, um, I was house sitting with my friend, um, Brandon Shimoda and we both experienced what we thought were, um, supernatural sound, like sounds that we, that were inexplicable. So they felt kind of supernatural to us. And this poem emerged out of that. It's called Lucid Ruse. The baby shits the bed again. Little herring, let's bathe you and me. I'll tell you a ghost story. House sitting for Joshua, for Emma forever ago on repeat for hours, asleep on the couch, I felt hover a ghost. Go find Brandon, I said. Place your icy fingers around his shingled ribs. In the morning, I emptied a bottle of Garnier Fructis fortifying shampoo. Is Joshua's hair curlier than mine? Must be. He's your standard tropical bird type, books arranged by subject on tables in every room. I wrote to Joshua, I love your apartment's friendly ghost. After cleaning the sheets, me and the baby are naked on the bed. What poet hasn't wished at least once in her life that poetry was dead? It's true that that was written around um, kind of that point, I think, in a lot of writers' lives where they are wondering what it is that they're doing, um, which maybe happens with more regularity for some than others. Um, this is the last sequence in the book, and um, I'm going to read it straight through. It, it consists of about 14 pretty short sections. Um, and I'll just have a little pause in between each, each section. It's called Creeping Time. A car rolls to a stop. Want a lift, the passenger says. The red leather seats are exquisitely clean. Our road hugs a sea. The driver's eyes drift. By the time we arrive, the passenger sleeps. The driver and I lock eyes. Come here, she says. 
When she moves the passenger's head, it comes off in her hands. Take it, she says. Inside, my children feed it a spoonful of sand. Come wind, come rain, carry April into May. Over the door, I secure the head. It can see both ways. Have you always been called Rob? Robbie, I say. Let's try something. See the pillow? That's Robbie. What's he like? He doesn't live in fear, I say. He's mostly just alive. Can you pick him up? Hold him to your chest? I shut my eyes. I remember the delivery room, mid-April, the lilacs obscene. The midwife says the baby is breech, hours away. Oh, the fuck it is, Keisha says, summoning the ocean inside her, which carries her body through plaintive breaks, peripheries we come from, the strange vast ruins in which I believe. The baby emerges at a weird angle the midwife anticipates, she receives him beautifully, but no more so than Keisha delivered him from one emergency into the next. Dad, the midwife hands me a pair of scissors. It's the kind of morning a child, bleary eyed from a night of swimming, might emerge from the house to find her sibling face down in the water but my children are merely sleeping and I can't separate their beauty from the future violence they will commit, nor from the violence to be committed against them. Wasps enter the nest shaped like the globe I'd spin, stop with a finger on the X of my death. I empty a can of poison. The next day, the wrong part of the nest is melted. Wasps cling to the eve as if consulting with each other on the shape and meaning of time. My daughter spots a whale spouting offshore. Days after swimming in the ocean, I can feel the ocean at home in my ear. The giant Pacific octopus weaves her eggs into strands she hangs from the ceiling of a cave. For months, she waves her arms, providing them a steady supply of fresh water. She eats nothing. Months become years. When they hatch, her babies are the size of a grain of rice. She blows them from the cave, then dies. In a crack in the neighbor's wall, a spider wraps silk around an inchworm. My son kicks the wall. The spider retreats. What are you doing? I say. Intervening, he says. Is the difference between suffering and survival lost in my refusal to take a side? But that was yesterday, when who I was haunts me like the lowercase tragedy life is. Outside the curved lines of a cloud, my daughter colors the sky red. I sit on the floor and count my breaths. Color with me, she says. When the minute hand reaches the 10, I say. She walks in a circle around me. Against my ear, she presses the cool face of my watch. What would you rather have, I say? The ability to know what others are feeling or the power to stop time? She can feel you staring, my daughter says, of the heron in the pond in her drawing. 
I sponge the milk my son spilled. He dares his sister to read my mind. Keisha thaws chicken on the counter. Is it dangerous to defrost feelings at room temperature? In the painting of the ocean over the TV, the illusion of movement distilled in waves about to fall is all the more vital for being trapped on paper. What if is one way to begin? The rose tapping the window wants in. I ask my son if there's a god or goddess of time. There's only culture, he says. Three weeks after burying the bird the cat left on the porch, my daughter asks what the bird looks like now. What if everything we say is one long sentence that only ends when we end? Fine, my daughter says. But what do you mean, end? Love poem for my son, his breath, a net for grief, a climate for my daughter's face, cobwebs break for Keisha, a wake in the night for the earth, a book burning in water, for my family when I'm not here, for everything I feel, for language when it's ready to heal. What that means, I can only fathom in trees. I wonder how they see me. My children know, but will they, when it's time, sit with me when I... A maze of paths funnel me toward a square of glass in whose reflection I'm two people, one not speaking to the other. I build a boat and call it song. Its oars transform into the sons of Ares, who deliver me to an ocean ruled by the sorceress of the palace of seaweed. She sinks my pulse to the jellies. That you long to see, she says, suggests your relationship to death is rich. But water favors those who feel it. I have no place to put everything my children make me feel. Can I imagine a future in which they reject me? Cracks in the hull of the vessel we're in. How far I would swim to save them. Like waves, they threaten my capacity to love, then vanish love's limits. The long hand points to the minute, short hand the hour. Where will I be when you die, my daughter says. She places a wreath of time in a hole in the trunk of the hawthorn. There's an easier way, I say, but I'm too late. Branches descending like arms lift her into the canopy. From here, she says, I can see. Birds? At every grave. Clouds? One. Our prayers? All wrong. What is time like? A green lake? Can you touch it? I learn the contradictions. Do they end? Who would we be if they did? Winds? Warm. Is there a flag? Kids wave branches like wands. What is it called? May. This is the last poem in the book um, and the last I'll read from um, 
child care. June. I hold the line to a kite. When it falls, what remains of the sentiment that it was flying? Higher, the children say. I let go more line. I'm, that was beautiful. They're giving us so much to think about, to ponder. I'm so glad you read the long sequence. I've been wanting to talk to you about that. I have to say, just right away, the um, I, the the your your poems, as all great art does, have the ability to just make me aware and notice things more, and. I found myself because of that last poem just today, an hour ago, walking along School Street here in the village, I stepped over a, a, the line of a kite that someone had dropped and I wouldn't have thought about it before. But yeah. because of your poem, I found myself thinking about it. And and even as, as you were reading about time, the different kinds of time and the distance, the channel, buoy is going off at regular intervals as though to I, I, the, the, the pendulum of emphasizing the, uh, the, the, the movement. Um, yeah. And so I, it, I also, I love that the, that long sequence and the whole book actually is full of uh, the sensory experience of the sea uh, the ocean is really um, crucial as metaphor, but also as experience in in, in much of your work, I think. Yeah. Uh, and and it's now has has special resonance because I know I dragged you in to the very cold water in Stonington the other day for a what we call a cold plunge. And I I will say to the viewers out there that Rob. Uh, it was very cold, you know, 50 degrees, if that, uh, and shocking, and but it was fun. And, and But I thought that was it. And a few days later, there was a frost warning here in the village and uh, or across southern Connecticut. And uh, I woke up that morning and thought, wow, it's, there's a frost warning. And I got a text from Rob saying, <laughs> do you want to go for a swim? So we went for a swim. So uh, I love that. Now, I the um, I, things to that I want to ask about some general things. The uh, you are able to work with sequence in a very artful way, and I'm curious. And so we'll think about this last poem, "Creeping Time." The the sequence of it. I'm curious about how that was written. I uh, order uh, yeah. pieces that uh, how how did it come together as a long sequence? When did you start? Did you conceive of it at the beginning as this long, incredible sequence? It's an extraordinary poem. Yeah, um, th that's a great question. One that. Um, I think about with almost every poem I write, I almost feel like every poem I write should be or might be better served if it were part of a long sequence. And this is something I've felt like um, since first encountering in graduate school, um, C.D. writes Deep Step Come Shining, which is this amazing mm -hmm. length poem. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been most moved, I think, by sequences as a human being, because there's something about duration and the accumulation of these seemingly discrete moments that to me are so much more representative of what it it's like to be alive like you have these days and they accumulate in the way that these these discrete moments in a sequence or a series accumulate um so 
so when I do like write a standalone one night stand poem that just is like 20 lines and it's kind of over, I feel like I'm kind of, I don't know, it feels too artificial sometimes to me. Mm -hmm. but I like, I like writing them sometimes because they do have, a, they feel like they're, they have a boundary and like they are contained. Mm -hmm. um, so to get to your question about that particular sequence, which is like, I think it's 14 or 15 or 16 sections. I'm not sure exactly, but it, it used to be like 30 sections. And it used to also include many of the sequences that are in or, sorry, many of the sections that are in another sequence in the book called The Maelstrom. Mm. And it was one long thing. And, and to be honest, sometimes I think of this whole book as one long sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm tempted to just like remove all the titles at certain mm -hmm. points. Mm -hmm. um, I love the sound of that bird in the background. I know, that is it's a pretty, uh, that bird wants to be part of this reading. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a real challenge to figure out what belonged in that poem and what didn't. And the themes kind of emerged. One theme in the maelstrom was like figuring out my, as a, as a male, my relationship to my son, um, who's, you know, also identifies as a male and how there's this um, patriarchy that we're a part of. And so it kind of became clear what, what sections didn't belong in Creeping Time because those themes were stronger in those sections. Mm -hmm. So that kind of became its own sequence. But if I had a couple more, you know, if I had time, I might, I, I feel like I could put them back together and it would just change creeping time in a different way and add another trail through that, mm -hmm. another thread that would probably work. That, that uh, leads me to ask something that I found myself thinking about as you were reading, you, you uh, captured children's voices, the, the, your children are are major actors in this on this stage, uh, and I'm I'm wondering. Well, first, I, I am aware of how you, as a parent, are learning from your children. That the children are with the the your the careful attention you are giving to their language. Um, you are making discoveries and 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 capturing that um, the, the, the whole, uh, the attention to attention in the book is really interesting. But yeah. the, uh, what are you beginning with? What's the raw material for the things that the children say in this book? Or do you, no, I, I, I don't want to say like, did they really say this? But the, uh, what, I'm curious about, I guess, is to to what extent do you feel free to keep reconfiguring the the language that is attributed to the children? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I feel like a lot of what is said, I'll just answer plainly, a lot of what is said they said in the book, they really did say mm -hmm. most of the time in those contexts, mm -hmm. a little, a few times it might've been outside of that context a little bit, but um, I haven't had, I don't feel like I, I need to like, was the word recapitulate that you used? Like, I don't feel like or I need to figure. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know I need to re, I didn't have to really. Okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. But it is except <laughs> when you had mentioned that like the attention that I pay to their language is, is such a, like, it seems like such careful and close attention that comes, I feel like at the expense of paying attention to like them sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be, you know, wanting to, to think about what, how, what they just said was so profound that it's kind of like, 
am I making sure that we're holding hands when we cross the street? Also, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm sure you are. The, I mean, you, you, uh, uh, the the pressure you put on yourself with that in mind is clear from the uh, tensions ex expressed yeah. in the in the book. But I, I'm, I really appreciative of the attention to attention. Um, it it uh, is a way of making me as a reader notice to to pay attention. Um, and, and I think of the uh, Merrill's poem that you you read from and his uh, attention to essentials. And mm -hmm. I can see why that is a key poem for for you because your your work does seem to be uh, wanting to pare down without paring down. And Jim Jim described it beautifully. You know, there's an abundance there uh, that that somehow you're able to uh, convey, express with rigor um, and and you, you don't need abundance to express abundance. Um, but the the essentials, your your uh, drive to get at essentials is clear in in this book and and beautifully successful, I think. The uh, another thing that you uh, return to and, and poetry does is is a, a you know one of the essential subjects is love, but also more broadly feeling. Um, what do we feel? How do we say what we feel? And the the poems get me thinking about the how feeling is to some extent learned, or maybe because of the children in the the book, their presence that they're what they feel doesn't match the adult sensibility, uh, and the so so we can see how feeling itself becomes an, a construction mm -hmm. and. Uh, you were trying to get to the essentials yeah. uh, beyond the construction. Yeah. Well, I have a lot to say about feelings, um, but I, I used to not because uh -huh. like you mentioned, I played baseball mm -hmm. and I was a pitcher and I was trained to hold everything in and to show no emotion on the mound because you were, if you did, you were, you know, either not honoring the tradition of the game so much, or this is what I remember coaches saying, or you were, you know, showing your hand and, and you'd be giving the other team an advantage or whatever. So I, I was pretty good at not showing, revealing mm. any kind of emotion for a really, really long time. And that also, I think, um, came through in, in, in like a lot of poetry that I wrote. Um, and then with this book and having children, you're right. Like there's a certain type of, um, I don't know, it's like an exfoliation of, or it's like a pulling away of those shells, the walls that I had constructed um, because I have to help them figure out how to navigate their emotions, but in order for them to do that, I should probably be able to do that on my own. But mm. it took me a long time to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I found myself thinking weirdly of Ashbery. I just uh, the I uh, I guess the attention in, in Ashbery to how emotion is disguised or or played or or that is mm. theatricalized and ways yeah. uh and and uh, i'm thinking about this a lot myself the uh to what extent are are we anxious and depressed because the culture has told us taught us to be anxious and depressed yeah. for instance but to what extent are we also um forgetting what we could feel because of the need to not show our our right. hand right um so uh that that you're you, you you press in a, it, it almost at times, it's a, a, this wonderful neutral, uh, how should I put it? A, a, a point of, new, or, or a, a 
feeling of neutrality that opens us up to potential passion that, mm-hmm. you know, it's very, it can be very cool or I think neutral is the better word there, but then there's abundance, there's passion yeah. there that, yeah. that's, that's somehow contained. And I think in partly in the, the, the movement of the line, partly in the, the, uh, ornateness of the sequences yeah and uh, that in fact there are a couple of really good questions that have come in so i just wanted to uh, see if we have a bit of time for that um from jen groats uh she asks she says beautiful reading with rich resonance between your work and jim longenbach uh including your writing in section sequences and so she asked would you like to say more about what makes a poem want to be in sections or in sequences. So that's a, that's a, a yeah. distinct thing in a way, structurally. And uh, yeah, I remember a- Jim talking about the difference between a series and a sequence. Um, and maybe that's what Jen's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, um, yeah, one to me feels like something that um, can be read it has it invites you to maybe read it non chronologically because there isn't a kind of there isn't a kind of necessary logic that accrues between mm. sections or sequences mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and the other feels like it requires a certain kind of progression um because you're making maybe a a more you're trying to make a more explicit argument Mm -hmm. Um, but now that I say that out loud, it's hard for me to like, think about altering the order of any of my sequences Mm -hmm. without fundamentally changing their meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wish I had a better answer to that. No, that's very interesting. And it, 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 you're, I, the, I uh, what was the line about um, the I uh, 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 the first poem beginning with the sentence a logic no syntax can trace that yeah. that's uh, I does seem to be underlying the ambition uh, the, to to I uh, the, to create a logic but a logic that is not borrowed a logic that mm-hmm. is not predictable um and and in that sense it it but i i think i can you know make the comparison to ashbury that mm-hmm. that they're that that the the uh aura of a of a really intense logic but that logic is disrupting in some way i i i can understand how once you've achieved that in your work you don't want the pieces shifted. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, hey, and here's uh, something from uh, Christopher Spade. Wonderful, wonderful reading. Love your poems. Loved hearing them for the first time post childcare. What's it been like writing in Stonington in relative isolation? Um, and do James Merrill and David Jackson feel like family? <laughs> they do, for sure. Start, they're starting to feel like family. I mean, the David Jackson apartment's just so comfortable. Um, mm-hmm. And the Merrill side's like a museum. It's alive. It's a living museum for sure. Um, but it's funny you should ask, that Chris should ask about what it's like to write there after childcare. Um, the other day I went to Dodge Paddock and um, it was a place that my friend Dave um brought me my first night there and uh there's this beautiful i think it's are those limestone rocks or is it all granite i i I, it could be a combination i know there's a lot of granite but probably by the shore limestone yeah yeah so i was i was sitting out there and um i i had the sudden urge to want to describe a la Bishop at the fish houses, uh-huh. like what, what this like 
one square foot of shoreline was like in the water. And, and so I was like, I'm just going to dig into this. And I wrote as, as long as I could in my, in my notebook and um, was just trying for like pure description, but with like the constraints of poetry. So it was, I was trying to make it lyrical, but also just really sort of like imagery that was as vivid as possible. Um, and, and I was thinking, okay, this feels like the kind of poem that might help me sort of get past writing about being a parent somehow, because I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to kind of write poem and I have, but yeah, there's this, always this pull to sort of continue to write about the tensions of, of being a parent and a poet at the same time. So this, this particular moment of um, intense description was like, it felt really like exciting to me. So yeah. I went back to the David Jackson apartment and a few hours later, um, I tried calling Keisha, uh, my wife, and I should say, I wouldn't be able to do this if she weren't such a badass because she's <laughs> at home. Um, One needs that, yeah. Yeah. So, so I tried calling her um, just to talk and she said, oh, Lindy, our daughter wants to, to FaceTime with you. She's in the garden. And I said, okay. So we tried to FaceTime and she was going to show me the garden, but she couldn't because the wi Wi-Fi was bad. So mm. she just was talking to me from the garden. And I, and I said, well, just tell me what you see. So she started describing the spring garden for like 10 minutes. Oh, how just going around from flower to flower and blossom to blossom. And I thought, oh God, I'm gonna have to, this is probably gonna end up as part of like the second part of the poem that I just wrote. Like, totally, that's beautiful. <laughs> I that, can't really escape it. Would, would you, um, do you have some new poems you'd like to read before we just have a, a few minutes? So uh, if there's, there's yeah. something well, that's not in the book you'd like to read? Yeah, I'll, I'll think of maybe a, a short one. I mean, I kind of wanted to finish. Yeah, I'm going to just read Jim's. I'm going to read Jim Longabox Thursday. Oh. That's what I'm going to do. Because um, this is probably in my top five favorite Longenbach poems. And I wanted to have a Jim poem at the beginning and a Jim poem at the end. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. OK. Um, a lot of you probably already know this poem. Thursday. Because the most difficult part about making something, also the best, is existing in the middle. Sustaining an act of radical imagination, I simmered a broth, onion, lemon, a big handful of mint. The phone rang. So with my left hand, I answered it, sauteing the rice, then adding the broth slowly, one ladle at a time. With my right, hello? The miracle, it's easy to miss, is the moment when the husks dissolve, each grain releasing its tiny explosion of starch. If you take it off the heat just then, let it sit while you shave the Parmesan into paper thin curls. It will be perfectly creamy, but we'll still have a bite. There will be dishes to do. The moon will rise and everyone you love will be safe. I don't know if it gets any better than that poem. <laughs> Speaking of badass, Jim made a mean risotto. <laughs> <laughs> he really, it was great. I uh, couldn't couldn't compare. I've never had a better risotto. Nice. Well, thanks for all your questions and for the questions. Well, thank you, and and uh, thanks to the um, our our 
audience and for your questions. And um, I hope this time is, is continues to be wonderfully productive for you, Rob, and, and uh, the, uh, your attention to the landscape and the setting and uh, Meryl is, is uh, wonderful. So uh, we, it's great to have you here and, and we look forward to reading the work that that is inspired by this experience for you. Thank you. So thank you for, for your reading. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Bye, everyone. So hi. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bergen. It is uh, lovely to see the James Merrill hidden study of, of 107 uh, behind you. It's very nostalgic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. So this is um, this is my my new book. It's called The Math Campers. Uh, my own novel. Uh, it's called These Women. It looks like this. Well, the first thing I'll say is all the dreams are actual dreams. Um, there's nothing worse than a fabricated dream. You can always tell. So I normally don't write in first person because of the fact that as soon as you have a narrator, you tend to have somebody listening, or there's an implied audience. I just got to soak up in the atmosphere in that house. You just feel like a writer and you feel like you're part of this um, tradition and a community. And it feels like the work is important. Magical things happen when you're looking at Meryl's books. Well, it was a really, really transformative uh, residence for me. Um, it, that might sound like a bit of an overstatement, but it, it, it really was that Meryl's really distinct imagination was present Thanks. in every detail. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> Bye. Enjoy Stonington on my behalf. <laughs>